Hello and welcome to the RTPI West of Scotland Doors Open Day webinar, focusing on sustainable community initiatives within Glasgow. Sustainable cities and communities are ever more important in the majority of our lives. This is highlighted as sustainable communities are goal number 11 of the UN Sustainable uh, Development Goals, with the aim to make cities and settlements uh, inclusive, safe, resilient and sustainable. Glasgow is the largest city in Scotland, with an estimated population of 626,000, set to increase by a further 3% in the next years. With an ever-growing population and times of increasing challenges from both the local and global context, the RTPI West of Scotland chapter would like to take this opportunity to highlight some local projects which are striving to achieve the aims of the UN goals. This ranges from environmental-based projects to ensuring sustainability, Sustainable community initiatives are embedded in current development projects and beyond the fiscal side to the well-being of communities. We will hear from four different speakers, followed by a short question and answer session at the end. Firstly, I would like to introduce Gillian Dick, Spatial Planning Manager at Glasgow City Council, who is going to talk about how Planning Department at Glasgow City Council is trying to support local sustainable community initiatives. Hi, Kat. I will just share, and hi everybody as well, I will just share the screen so that you can see the slides so that you're not just preoccupied with listening to me and you have something pretty to look at. So hopefully the slideshow works, there you go. That's cool. So Glasgow, it does sometimes, sun does sometimes come out. So I'm Special Planning Manager, uh, Research and Development in the Development Plan Group. And I'm going to talk to you about some of our place-based approach and nature-based solutions. And I hear you cry already, what is a nature-based solution? Well, a nature-based solution uh, has a lot of different things in it, but it starts by saying that any project doesn't just have a beginning, a middle and an end, that there uh, is a whole load of things that go around. A lot of the time we look at projects, we do the planning and the delivery and we forget about the stewardship. So we think, yes, we've survived, that's grand and let's move on. Uh, and we do lots of different things around the technical solutions, the governance, financing. We try and get businesses out of some of this. We try and work with our communities. We try and sit back and reflect on what we've achieved and we try and monitor it. But sometimes we don't get all that balance right. The other thought process around nature-based solutions is people just go, oh, that's biodiversity, that's fine. Well, it's about much, much more than that. So let's take a little deep dive into what we're doing so we can explain about some of the projects we're doing. So when people think about nature-based solutions, there's a kind of nice uh, way of looking at that the University of London have defined that says, does it use nature or natural processes? Does it provide or improve social benefits? Does it provide or improve economic benefits? Does it provide or improve environmental benefits? And does it have net benefit on biodiversity? Now, I don't, I get doubled up with all my net benefits. So in my brain, I say, is any action that I'm taking on any of the grand or buildings in Glasgow, does it have do, or do no harm to social cohesion, whether that's the humans or the habitat um, communities? Does it do no harm to the health and well-being? Does it do no harm to the economy? Does it do no harm to the environment? And does it do no harm to the biodiversity? If I'm answering no to any of those, then I need to rethink what I'm trying to do. Because if you're just focusing on economic recovery, for instance, then you could well be doing harm to the social cohesion, not only of the human population, but of the habitat population as well. So we take this with a place-based approach and we sometimes say it's a place-based approach with a nature-based solutions lens. That means we're looking at the challenges that impact on our society and then multiple challenges that we have to cope with. We want to come up with solutions that we can design at scale in Glasgow, that we can come up with one solution and that can be replicated or used by other communities so we're not constantly reinventing the wheel. That means we're also looking at biodiversity net gain, inclusive governance, so working with communities on these solutions and whether they're economically feasible. Because a lot of the time we have bright ideas, but we don't have the finances or the wherewithal to do it. It also means we're doing a whole load of trade-offs between the different challenges and the different kind of lenses that nature-based solutions to so those, looking at the social cohesion, the health and well-being, the environment, the economy, the biodiversity all at once. That means we need to be adaptive about our management. And what we're trying to ultimately do is mainstream this and make this a sustainable future for our city. But it's just all about place. So there's some handy kind of quotes there for you. Jane Jacobs, if you ever heard of her, said way back in the 60s, and I'll paraphrase, if you don't like the place you're in, why would you fight for it? Why would you defend it? Um, Sir Patrick Geddes, uh, 100 years ago, based in Edinburgh, one of my heroes, said it was all about live, work, play. 
and the right folk in the right place at the right time. And a way of having that conversation nowadays is through the place standard that's been developed in Scotland and allows communities, whether it's communities of people or communities of um, businesses or whatever, to have a conversation about places. So what makes a space into a place? What makes it sustainable? We try and embed all of that in our development plan, which like everybody else's development plan says, we're gonna have a healthy, high quality place and a compact city. And like everywhere else in the world, we want a vibrant, thriving, connected and green place. All of this fits the UN SDGs as well. We try and embed that in our open space strategy, which looks at not only the quantity of open spaces, but also the quality. Now, if you're thinking about the spaces between buildings, remember that it's not just the green, it's the blue and the grey. All of these have opportunities to make our communities more sustainable. And we have other interventions like green roofs, rain gardens, street trees, green walls. So actually your open space is not only on the ground, but it's on the side of buildings and on the roof as well. So we're trying to deliver for future needs. We're trying to look at the access and the quality, the quantity, the amenity, what people think of those spaces, what you can do with the grey. We want those spaces to allow us to play, learn, do formal sports or informal, places to grow things, walk, cycle, improve our air quality, reduce the noise, and then deal with some of the climatic things that are gonna hit us, make our city more resilient. So the flood alleviation, enhanced biodiversity, connect the habitats, mitigation and adaption, and what we do with our blue spaces. The biggest open space in Glasgow is actually the River Clyde. All of that will allow us to look at which spaces we want to retain, where we need new open spaces, which ones we want to redefine, and which ones might be redundant. All of this allows us to have a look at how we're going to do swaps, but some of that may well be met by the vast amount of vacant and derelict land we have across Glasgow. A lot of these were the reason why we started looking at strategic stall spaces 10, over 10 years ago. We had lots of vacant derelict land, which was having a negative impact on people's uh, mental health and well-being. There was lots of sites with planning permission, but awaiting implementation. There was unmet demand for growing spaces. We've had continuous impact of economic downturns, the pandemic being the latest one. And we weren't listening to people's lived experiences in their communities, what they thought about the areas. And we kept going in as a council and doing temporary interventions, but not explaining to communities why we were doing them. If you look at what the communities want, there was a whole load of underused open spaces of vacant direct land. We had individuals saying we could do something. We had groups saying we could do something. They were coming up with ideas, but how do we get them connected to the owners of the site and get them permission to use those sites? How do we connect them to the technical expertise? How do we connect them to the resources and how do we connect them to the funding? That's what the strategic stall spaces tried to do. If you look back, my earlier slide showed you the connecting nature framework, and I've just used that to embed what we're doing in strategic stall spaces. And it shows the ebb and the flow of the different things. So we have had an awful lot of kind of emphasis at the start and planning and delivery on the governance, on the financing, on measuring the impact, but it wanes as we go through. So you end up leaving it and the stewardship will encourage people to think about businesses, but only if they're resilient enough to do so and they know how to do it. So over 10 years, we've had 125 projects, but some of them have not been resilient enough to survive. So... They have had an impact on all of those things you can see around the site, but the majority have been growing spaces or landscaping with a little bit of public art, a little bit of activity and a few events. But they've all tried to hit different outcomes, but some of them have maybe only hit it for a very small time. And as a council, we've assumed that the communities that are doing something are resilient. The feedback we've had is great. People have become more physically active, they've got to know their neighbours, they've gained new skills and it's integrated those spaces into their neighbourhoods. It's transformed area of neglect, it's brought transformation and it's provided opportunities. But how do we sustain that without assuming that we're just going to um, bankroll it the whole time? And how do we find out what tools the communities need to make this more sustainable? We've tried to embed it in lots of different um, strategies and policies to try and make sure that the skill sets that we have as a council and the skill sets that the third sector and other um, government bodies or um, key agencies have can help. So all of this stuff, embedding stalled spaces within 
parks plan, within local biodiversity, our growing strategy, our housing strategies and trying to look at our vacant dirt land, aligns us with the UN SDGs, aligns us with the work that Scottish Land Commissioner Community Land Scotland are doing, but ultimately what we're asking to do is what we're trying to do is find out what support communities need. So the food growing strategy will give them support in how to grow things. The vacant and derelict land asks will look at how we can put uh, land over to communities. The housing strategy will look at how we can create open spaces or growing spaces within those communities. All of this together means hopefully that we can start working collaboratively. And I'll stop there. Thank you very much, uh, Gillian. Uh, sustainable communities uh, certainly are really embedded in the planning. Uh, department at Glasgow City Council and it's also really great to see a holistic approach in taking this quite often in the past it would be economical first and then societal and environmental second so it's really good to see that that's not the case at Glasgow and um, I'll now pass over to our second speaker uh, Sean Kelly uh, who also works alongside Gillian at Glasgow City Council. Uh, Sean is a senior project officer um, on the Connecting Nature uh, programme and is also working on the Open Space Strategy which is brought in as part of the 2019 Planning Act. Thanks Kat. Uh, yeah, hi everyone, I'm uh, Sean Kelly and as Kat says I work at Glasgow City Council in Gillian's team who we just heard from. Um, today I'm going to talk a little bit more about the Open Space Strategy in the context of sustainable communities. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about the Connecting Nature project that Jillian and I are, are part of. Um, and then I'm going to look at some, um, well, a recent initiative that we've developed um, in Connecting Nature with conjunction with the, the Open Space Strategy and some of our extern external partners. So, next. Thanks, Jane. Um, okay, so Jillian's already talked about the open space strategy. Uh, I'm not going to go into a huge amount of detail at that at this point, but I will talk a little bit about the Connecting Nature project. Um, the Connecting Nature project is a Horizon 2020 project. It's funded by the EU, and we're looking at research and innovation into um, upscaling urban nature-based solutions. Glasgow is one of the three front runner cities. Um, we've got a, a partner city with Genk and West Poznan in Poland. Um, and together we are working to deliver uh, exemplar projects. And in Glasgow, our exemplar project is the Open Space Strategy Delivery Plan. Um, and you can see uh, the, the dashboard in front of us here, which is one of our, our main outputs so far. Um, the, the delivery plan is basically a data-led GIS map, which will help us to better inform our open space uses across the city. Um, the delivery plan will see lots of social, economic and environmental benefits for the city and therefore we consider this to be a, a nature-based solution exemplar as Gillian had um, spoke about before. So, so far we have developed this da data dashboard which is where we um, include all the different various data sets that we collect from different sources within the council and out with. Uh, we've also tied out some extensive quality assessments and done some access analysis. Um, we've supported some local nature-based solution projects, such as the Grow Chapel project that we're going to come on to talk about later by um, Hilda. And now we're needing a first draft version of the delivery plan map, which focuses on the provision of good quality and accessible multifunctional community spaces. Um, and then we'll be hoping to go out to public consultation uh, later this year on that. So keep an eye out for that. Next, please, Jane. Thank you. Okay, so we all recognise the importance of open space, um, especially recently, the pandemic has obviously um, made us all much more aware of how important it is to have uh, open space on your doorstep, good quality open space on your doorstep for a variety of reasons. And in the last year and a half, that's been mostly down to social interaction and, um, and for amenity purposes, but there's a, a broader use behind that as well, um, particularly in cities like Glasgow, which are pretty urban, pretty dense, um, and, uh, you know, smaller community spaces are, are therefore more valuable. Um, but what do we mean by sustainable communities? Um, I guess it's quite a, a broad term, and it could be argued in lots of different ways. The word sustainable has obviously been argued um, over and over and over again in the last few decades. Um, 
I, I'm going to give what we would define as being a scalable community. Um, I mean, it could mean being self-sufficient with food growing or having nil unemployment or achieving our net zero carbon emissions, or it could mean all of this and more. I would argue that the open space strategy has sustainable communities at its heart, though, with these three pillars that you can see on the screen just now. Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail this because Jillian already touched upon them, but basically um, having a livable city to access to quality spaces and co-produced facilities, healthy city with uh, play and education sport, improved air quality, better growing spaces, more opportunity for active travel, that sort of thing. Um, and a resilient city, so enhancing biodiversity, water management, mitigating and adapting to climate change is all, all part of that. And these all strongly relate to how we define nature-based solutions in terms of the desired economic, social and environmental benefits. So that's the core of what we're trying to achieve in Connecting Nature with our delivery plan. Um, next slide, please, Jane. So this slide um, looks a bit scary. I had Jillian's already um, thrown up the Connected Nature, Nature-Based Solutions Framework, which you can see here on the right. And I'm not going to go into a huge amount of detail on that because, well, basically that's a whole other presentation on its own. Um, but I wanted to show it to you because I wanted to, to um, introduce the, the initiative that we developed over the last year, which is the Nature-Based Accelerator Pilot Programme. Um, so first of all, what is the Nature-Based Accelerator? Um, it basically is a business support program for uh, early stage social and nature-based enterprises that are operating within the city or want to operate within the city that help us to achieve the objectives, objectives of the open space strategy that we just discussed a, a moment ago. Um, I'll, I'll go, go on to talk about the accelerator in more detail and our journey so far in a second. But before we do that, I just wanted to say why we have decided to um, to, to embark on this initiative. As you can see from the framework here, there are three distinct stages to developing a nature-based solution project. And um, that begins with obviously the planning stage into the delivery stage and then into stewardship. And again, Gillian touched upon the stewardship phase, which is often overlooked um, or the, not given as much attention as perhaps it should do, because this is what the, the key component is to making a sustainable community. It needs to be, um, you need to be able to have strong stewardship over any nature-based solution project in order to help achieve sustainable communities. I've circled here where you can see where the nature-based accelerator pilot fits in, and it's basically it's about trying to encourage local nature-based entrepreneurship um, to help support the aims of the open space strategy, as I said there. And the key components of the framework are on the left-hand side of the page. And what we're trying to do with the Accelerator is capture and implement those two um, phases that are highlighted, which is financing and business modeling and entrepreneurship. So I've set it up on that, and we can move on to the next slide now, Jane, and I'll talk a little bit about the, the journey so far. So basically, um, what we had to do first of all was secure some seed funding, so some small seed funding that we managed to um, secure with the help of Gillian. Thank you, Gillian. Um, once we had that, we were able to then start doing some uh, mapping exercises because basically Connected Nature Project and the Council, as you probably would imagine, have limited resources um, and don't necessarily have all the expertise in providing such a, a programme as a nature-based uh, and support programme. So it was essential that we had to identify some key partners. And to do that, we had to make sure that we were taking on board partners who uh, had the capacity to help us, but also had the expertise to help us develop a programme that would work. So we carried out a mapping exercise looking at potential partners across um, Glasgow and actually across Scotland um, to come on board and help us with that. We did that with our academic partners in um, Connecting Nature. and. Uh, that was quite a long process because we um, developed the methodology around red amber greening and looking at various aspects of different uh, accelerator programs that were already existing in um, Scotland and we wanted to find a program that we could adapt quite easily. The next thing to do then was to forge um, a partnership not just with the desired ex ex established accelerator program um, but with other uh, partners who could bring on board different aspects too. So we looked at the um, Glasgow Centre for Civic Innovation, who have a very strong local network. And we also worked with Glasgow Caledon University, who also have a, a strong business support unit within the university who could help us develop the programme. We weren't able to reinvent the wheel with this. It was a pilot. It is a pilot. Um, so we have been um, learning a lot as we go. 
when it came on to trying to attract participants for the um, the pilot program, we knew that we had to be clear with communications because nature-based activities, nature-based enterprises, nature-based solutions are all quite familiar to us perhaps um, and other people that I work with, but actually they're quite a, it's quite a relatively new term and can be unfamiliar to people. So it was key that we had a clear message going out to the public about who we were trying to attract for the Accelerator program. So we put together um, some careful, careful communications um, and we reached out to the what we hope was the right audiences. And in the end, we managed to um, get the message out there to quite a broad audience. And actually, we were almost overwhelmed with applications from potential participants, um, well, for a small team anyway. The target that we initially set out for this was um, to get about 10 quality applications. And then we were going to take on about three maybe up to five uh, participants onto the first pilot program. But actually, um, as a demonstration of the sort of demand for this sort of um, support, we ended up receiving over 40 um, quality applications. And so we took on board 15 participants onto this first uh, program. So um, the, the guys are actually just finishing up. Uh, the final session um, after three months is uh, this week and then um, we are putting in place a, a number of other uh, measures to support them going forward beyond the three month program. Um, the, the next thing for us to do though is to extract all the learning as a pilot as I said before there are things that we might do differently going forward um, but we'll talk about that on the next slide which we can move on to now. Thanks James. So yeah going forward then um, well, where do we want this to lead, I suppose? Um, for the participants themselves, what we've identified through the program is that there are a number of uh, thematic issues that have come out with people who are developing nature-based enterprises across the city. And that's things like where they get the funding from, that seems pretty obvious. One of the other main issues though is about land and about how people obtain land in which they develop their enterprises. And so um, one of the things that we're doing going forward is arranging some uh, focus sessions with the participants and perhaps others um, to look at these issues so that we can factor them into any future programmes. The participants will also become part of the Good Ideas programme alumni. Um, they're, they're also now part of the Connecting Nature platform, which is a virtual platform uh, where nature-based enterprises across Europe and across the world can connect and share business opportunities as well as learning opportunities as well. And we're also hopefully developing a design-led review of the programme with Glasgow School of Art. But basically, ultimately, what we want to develop here um, beyond the pilot is a much more robust programme that maybe is a bit longer than three months. Um, Gillian and I are going through a process at the moment of making a case to senior managers um, that we can uh, make this work in, in the longer term and hopefully create it as an annual programme going forward and possibly tying it in with the Sold Spaces programme that Gillian mentioned before. So it's quite an exciting time. Um, it's been great to work on this. And I think it's been one of the key components to helping create um, sustainable communities. Because with this, we're trying to achieve not only um, uh, kind of broader goals with, uh, with resilient communities, but also more focused as well. So we're looking at things like food growing and ecotourism, um, foraging workshops, uh, etc. There's lots going on here. So um, I would um, keep, a, keep an eye out for this going forward. Thank you, Jane. Next slide, and I think that might be redone. Yes, that's me. Great, thank you. Thank you very much, Sean. Um, as like much of Glasgow's population uh, living in a flat for the last 18 months during COVID, and various lockdowns, the, the open spaces have been really important and I think it's great to see that kind of programme being highlighted, especially looking at stewardship going forward um, in the long term. Particularly, I imagine what some of our community groups will uh, no doubt be experienced with. So I'm now going to pass over to Hilda from a, a new project out at Drum Chapel called Pro Chapel. So Hilda Campbell is a, a member of the speaking group and the CEO of Cope Scotland. Uh, a mental health charity with aims to work with others to build a kinder world where people suffer less, have improved well-being and share tools to help people manage challenges they face in life. So Hilda, I'll pass over to you just now. Thank you very much, Katrina, and also thanks for inviting me along today. 
We got involved with Grow Chapel because we recognise that for people's mental and emotional well-being, there are a variety of factors that are external to the individual, um, but can impact on that person's well-being. So the environment has a huge impact um, on people, just as people have a huge impact on the environment. And I've picked this image because in community psychology, you talk about seeing the tree within the woods. And sometimes we have to see people within the context of their life, their communities, the challenges that they're facing to then see, OK, what needs to get put in place? And one of the things which was clear from a lot of the work that we did around isolation um, and disconnection was the need for bumping spaces and sticky places. And a bumping space is a place where you just bump into people and have a wee blether. And a sticky space is a space where actually you can be there for a little while um, and have a conversation. So when I heard about Grow Chapel, we decided this has got so much potential for people to bump into each other, have a little chat, and as well as that, um, stay around, build um, relationships, um, get to know people, um, and take that as a baseline to move out into other developments in the community. Next. So... What we're really hoping for, and there's many partners involved in Grow Chapel, is to have a welcoming space where the local community can apply for a growing allotment for fruit and veg, but also it's a place which welcomes um, diversity and you don't just have to have a plot to be welcome there. So working with Enable, we are creating a scented statutory and a scented statutory is a place where you sit out and blather. Um, so it's a scented garden, but with spaces for people um, to talk, connect, explore other things that's going on, um, where we can have workshops. There's also going to be a pizza oven area and an area where we can have community barbecues, again, to share ideas and to build connections that will go on out with the specific community allotment. Next. We think this fits really well with open space strategy because sadly, I have, I've worked in Drum Chapel since 1991 and I get very, very tired of it always being referred to as an area of deprivation. That is not good for the people who live there that all the time when it's covered in the television, all it seems to be about is the negative. Um, whereas in fact, there's some amazing things which we're going to come to in a wee minute, which really need to be celebrated. So having this Grow Chapel initiative provides a hub and a focus for other activities which celebrate the diversity and creativity that exists within the community so that people actually think, wow, that's, <laughs> Trump Chapel is actually a really good place. And also where others might think, well, we want to invest in that, like farmers markets which is a bit further down the road, but we have got big plans for where all our fruit and veg and hopefully we're going to work with people with beehives and craft people, et cetera, et cetera, so that in the future, um, this is a place that people regularly go to who don't live in the area. And it also boosters the economy for that area, but it also boosts people's self-esteem, which is incredibly good for well-being. Getting involved in a uh, Grow Chapel itself is, is good for people's well-being. And the fact that we're seeking to work with as many diverse groups as possible to create a safe space so that people who are disabled will be working together, getting to understand each other through a common interest of what's actually happening in that growing space. And in so doing, beginning to look out with our own needs because COVID has been a very challenging time. We all know that. We're also aware that the planet is really suffering at the moment and that again can impact on our well-being. Suicide Prevention Day um, is Action Through Hope. And I'm really passionate that we start to put systems in communities that offer people hope for the future. So when people over feel overwhelmed by the climate emergency, they can look at small things that they can do collectively with others in their neighbourhood, which actually pushes back against some of the anxieties 
that are only natural um, in the face of the challenges that we face. So by looking after the planet, understanding the soil, feeding the soil, planting trees, growing vegetables, understanding um, from fork to food, what that whole journey is, involving schools, looking at what other spaces in the area um, can become, become growing spaces from a window box in someone's house that doesn't have a veranda to a veranda to a back garden. So Grow Chapel is one place, but the philosophy of Grow Chapel is how do we take this allotment area and really begin to expand in what is possible. Next slide, please. So in planning the sentence to do today, we had a meeting with a wide range of partners in the local community. And what came out loud and clear was there's actually a lot of activity already happening. So we produced this map and it's been printed off, thanks very kindly to Glasgow City Council who printed it off for us. Um, and it's been posted widely in the community where people can see it. And it's got headings around where there are growing spaces, how you can connect with nature, celebrating what's already there, how you can be active outdoors, also how we can build links with other networks interested in climate change, volunteering opportunities and information and learning. So one of the long, longer term uh, ideas we really have for Grow Chapel, which would be marvellous, is to um, bring in the stone a dry stone walling association and actually run courses on people to train in dry stain diking, which as well as providing some amazing um, dry stain dikes within the community also offers people uh, an alternative employment opportunity because following COVID there is definitely going to be a need for a lot of people to be thinking out the box in terms of retraining and doing other things and this map will be constantly um, updated and we also wanted to put in suppliers of plants gardening and tools locally and enables a local social enterprise so we're very keen to promote what they're doing but also for other local shops and things because again it's about how we encourage investment into the area um, so that there again creates more jobs, more opportunities for people and helps that community really to begin to thrive and celebrate. Next. So if you would like to find out more about how to get involved, that's uh, the email for a Grow Chapel. Or if you'd like to email me directly, it's hilda at cope-scotland.org. The little postcard there, um, we, it has a reverse side. It's about the promise that you're going to make to the world. We made up several thousand of these, which were very, very popular. Um, and it's about the promises that we make to ourselves. And Grow Chapel is a place where we are going to look at how we can recycle, upcycle, reuse, create wildflower meadows, be part of helping because that's one of the whole themes of Grow Chapel is growing a future for the children. A space where if someone is hurting, there's somebody there that they can talk to who knows what other services are available. So if that person needs more than just an informal chat, there are other options there. A sense of community by being part of Grow Chapel because you don't just have to have a plot as well as individuals having allotments, organisations also have allotments and they also have volunteers. So really, there are so many ways that people can get involved in this. Or it could just be people go in with a friend and sit in the centre statutory, learning some mindfulness practice because they're going to be doing workshops there or just being kind. And the whole theme there is the planet future matters to all of us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Hilda. Um, I think as a, a planner who's always a fan of uh, new phrases, I think I'll be encouraging you to sort of bump in spaces with sticky places in my vernacular going forward. Um, but finally, we hear from another community group, uh, members of the Hamilton Hill Playpit uh, Local Nature Reserve Management Group. Uh, Hamilton Hill is, of course, the city's newest local nature reserve. Um, here from that today are Vice Chair Bob Allison and Development Manager uh, Julianne Levitt to discuss it. Hi there. 
Can you all hear me okay? Hear you all fine? Yeah, I wasn't sure if it wasn't working or not. Hi, so I'm Julianne Levet and I'm the Community Development Manager on Hamilton Hill Clay Pits Local Nature Reserve and Bob's going to join me because Bob's been um, here since day one when it, the charrette first started back in um, 2011, I think it was. So we'll, we'll do this together and he'll kind of chip in to bit about the history of it. Um, so next slide, please. So we officially opened a couple of weeks ago um, on the 31st of July and um, it was anticipated we were going to be opened a couple of years ago but obviously Covid hit which was a big loss to us because that was going to be an amazing green space for the community but because of that um, it delayed it and the community couldn't use this green space so after many separate opening days it was supposed to be opened in April, then it was May, then it was June, then it was a few days in July. It officially opened July the 31st. It was an amazing success. We had over 1,600 people um, join us on the day. It was all community organisations. There was 15 stalls. It was the community organisations who, who showcased what they do in, in the, the community. We had people come from Edinburgh. We had people come from all over Scotland. It was just an amazing day. Um, and it's all over social media. So if you don't know about it, you can get every chance to look at it. You can see all the pictures. Jeannie Godley had opened it. She's a big advocate of the clay pits because of mental health. Um, so she was there and Bob's band played as well. So it was a, a great day. Next slide, please. So Bob, um, he can talk about the history and how the clay pits was created. Um, if you want to just jump in, Bob, and give a wee. Well, it started just before 2015. We had a, a thing called a charrette and got people from all over the community saying what they wanted to see here. Uh, we're by the, the Forth and Clyde Canal, uh, just, just behind Fur Hill, to give you some context to where we are. And it's a big bit of land that's been sitting for years doing nothing. Uh, Scottish Canal's own part of it, Glasgow City Council own part of it, and so uh, then they got an idea that if we all put it together, we could make it into something. And uh, the something was uh, a nature reserve. So as the previous people talked about in the community, uh, the Hamilton Hill community, uh, which includes Apostle, uh, Rock Hill, Mary Hill, Woodside, um, all, all these people had this wonderful place called the canal, but no way that it connected. So that's when we, we got together and um, Scottish Canals, Glasgow City Council, and uh, all the relevant uh, groups in the area got together and decided, you know, we could do something. So we came up with a plan for the nature reserve, but the big problem was, as always, money, how we're going to fund this. And we went to the council and they didn't have any money. And we went along next to uh, the uh, Scottish Parliament. They thought it was a great idea, but of course they didn't have any money. And as we were leaving the Scottish Parliament, with our heads down, as we're not going, a couple of the civil servants pulled us aside and said, look, you know, the EU has, a, uh, has funds that, that would fit this. So they sent us the information. We filled out the forms. We sent it to them. They looked at it. They sent it back, change this, change that, which we did, make a video and send it off to the EU. So we did. And lo and behold, they gave us the money. So that's how it started. And then um, it was decided that Scottish Canals would be the, the group that uh, would uh, manage the, the, the build of this. So there were 18 different packages and we started late 2016. And as we slowly, slowly moved along. Uh, the group then became a charity in 2018. And we start 
it was just then we started building. And then, of course, COVID hit and it stopped us for 18 months. Uh, but luckily, because it was outdoors, they were able to start work after six months of that. And we just recently opened. So I'll let you take it on from there, Julia. Okay, so next slide, please. So basically the aims. So the aims are obviously to increase awareness of access to an understanding of ecology and natural heritage, enable protection and enhancement of ecology and natural heritage. So I guess what we're trying to make people aware of, it's a place where it is of natural beauty. So we thought when it was going to be basically combined into a, a nature reserve that it would disturb um, the natural environment. And to an extent it did, but also it's created more species. So we want to basically have um, an educational spin in this. We want to bring schools out, we want to bring the community out, we want to learn how to, to look after the natural heritage. So basically, because it's about a mile from Glasgow city centre, we want to basically teach people that we have this amazing green space and we have all this natural enhancement in this green space. So one of the things we want to do is, is bring in the kind of education side of it, because people just think, oh, you live in Glasgow, you live in, in a town or a city or a, a wee suburb of Glasgow. They don't realise that in here there is lots of, there's animals, there's different species, there's different plants, there's, there's loads of different ecological and natural heritage, which people probably haven't discovered or don't know there is. So one of the big things we want to do is, is if a guided walks, so we have quite a lot of guest speakers on guided walks who can teach people all about the different plants in the clay pits, all about the different uh, habitants. There's, so we have possibly maybe every two weeks, Bob, we're having a, a guided walk with some sort of various speakers. So we have them based in arts and heritage, health and wellbeing, education, um, different various things. So that's what we're doing at the moment to basically educate people on what's actually at the clay pits. Next slide, please. So our focuses, so basically the, the focuses of the management group is quite a lot of things, actually, just to name a few. The main thing is environmental protection. The We have nine, nine people on the committee who all have different um, skills and experience to look after the site. Um, we have ecologists, people are interested in biodiversity. So although we are all volunteers on the site, we do all have a, a vetted interest in there. Um, we look after the site as well. So we do all the maintenance of it. We look after all the kind of um, health and wellbeing of any wildlife out there as well. Um, part of that, we have events. So what we do is we engage with the community. We ask them what they want on the site. So we have events, we have frog life out there. We have, um, we have different guest speakers, as I mentioned earlier on, and we have, um, I think, what else do we have, Bob? You do mainly events? Right, we, as I say, well, we have that. We, have a, we also have a bird watching, which is very popular. We do that. And as I say, part of our environment is envir environmental work is that we, we plant trees now. It may not sound like much, but when we were building the site, about 300 trees had to be either removed or cut down for one reason or another. So we've already planted 700 trees to replace them, and we're, pro we're going to do uh, 400 more. So our plans are to get the local community, all the schools, the nurseries, and all the other community groups in the area that come in and help us plant these trees. And this helps in two ways because we involve the local schools and community. So it gives us, gives them buy-in to the nature reserve and it's theirs. And they can all come and say, well, that's my tree. I planted that. And that's what we want. And it, and also, as I say, it then, it, you know, gives the local pride in the area, which we're, we're there to encourage. So, and uh, we're going to have, as I said, we're going to have events uh, as and when things get better. We're going to, uh, you know, have more and more people on the site. But already 
local people tell us it's such a great place for them to come. It's quiet. It's in the middle of the city. It's some place they can come and reflect in the evening after work or have a walk or just sit and, you know, and enjoy it. And we have obviously the wildlife. So you, if you're sitting quiet, suddenly a deer runs by you or walks by you, they, they're not afraid of you. And uh, so you, you do, you know, you get that kind of interaction as well. Yeah. So in terms of arts, so on our management committee, we have two artists as well who basically heavily involve anything that we do on the site to get involved in art. And if you are on actually on site, you'll see there's some quotes and some artwork from the late Alistair Gray. So we do quite a lot in terms of arts. Um, community engagement, as I said previously, we do a lot with the community. It's their space. We, we encourage them to tell us what to do. And we have what's called an out and about in the clay pits where we all meet up um, as and when, potentially maybe once a month, once every two months, depending on what we've got on. But we basically um, get the community voice and find out what they want in sight. If they want to have um, a specific event or a specific walk, a guided walk, um, we did a toddler walk as well to see if we can get like uh, parents and carers of, of toddlers now that people are back at work to try and get them a wee walk about to try and get out and about. Um, a lot of toddlers are obviously kids through lockdown, so it's to get them out and about. Um, a lot of people have obviously through loneliness and COVID, we get them out and about as well. So we do some walks, as Bob mentioned, we do the, we, we do the bird watching, we do litter picks. The litter picks are huge um, and it's been so successful that the last litter pick we'd done, we had basically, we struggled to get litter, as Bob had mentioned. So it's obviously taking care of itself and the community is obviously taking care of the area as well. Volunteering, we're going to set up a volunteering programme. We are in the process of getting a hub where we can have the hub where we can store our tools, we can store different things that we have for events. We can have like a wee training hub. Our volunteers are all meeting there. So that will be the next project along with our events and activity calendar. Next slide, please. So this is just a couple of activities that we've had in the past that were really successful. So we had the bike festival, nature discovery day, the big garden bird watch, monthly walks and artists in residence. These were just a few that we had prior to lockdown, but um, now that we're open and we have this 6.7 hectare of space, we are sourcing funding to try and fund more activities and events. So we'll have much, much more. Um, the, the event that we had in the 31st, our opening event, we have loads of community organisations that want to do work with us. So we are taking part in quite a lot of um, meetings at the moment. So you'll see lots of more activities appear as they come up. So we'll advertise that on social media, on our Facebook, um, various other places, Scottish Canals will also support us with that as well. So you'll see loads of more activities as we want to get the, the space used by, by everyone. Next slide, please. And again, since, to, since 2021, we've had out and about, we've had the litter plicks, the clean up, the bird watch walks, guided walks. There's a dialectogram project underway. We've had a clay pitch youth artist who's just joined us, mm -hmm. a botanical survey and a hello clay pits launch day. So this is just what we had in May. Um, as I say, this is growing. It's really, really successful. So we're going to have much, much more coming up. But this is just a few of our successes that we've had at the moment. Um, one thing I did like to mention is that the area was originally very industrial. So it's very, very, it's interesting. So we're going to basically have a heritage walk coming up shortly as well. So people will learn about the history of the clay pits because the clay used to actually line the canal many, many years ago. And that's how it was a clay pit. So our next big one is going to be a heritage walk. So you'll see more coming on there. Next slide, please. And this is just our contact details if you want to get in touch. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Bob and Julianne. Uh, that was really interesting. Um, as a kind of local to the, the nature reserve, it's been great over the last kind of 18 months, two years to kind of mm -hmm. see it. And I, it's a space that I never knew existed um, before, before this. And now to see it develop over the last while um, and really knit together the kind of communities that had been sort of broken apart by the canal. Um, and I am really excited to have a shot down the slide as well. It's just been put in next to Garstube Road. Part of the active travel. 
Um, so yeah, thank you very much to all our speakers. Uh, we're now going to move on to like a short uh, question and answer session uh, with questions submitted from the RTI West of Scotland. So if possible, I know some of our speakers can't turn on the cameras. That's fine, just do some connection. Um, so I'll just ask some questions out to the floor. And if you yourselves, any speakers would like to ask any questions any of other speakers, please feel ahead. Um, so I think probably the easiest one to start out with is um, what advice would you give to a local sustainability uh, community initiative starting out? Uh, Julia, do you want to come in first? Yep, I was waiting for direction, but I'll, I'll, I'll <laughs> go and then you can, you're can you going to have to punt us around. Uh, there's a number of things. Uh, the stuff that we've learned from stored spaces is to ask around, try and find out who owns the land. Because uh, that could be the easy thing. If it's owned by the council, then you can come to the council and we can figure out whether we want to, whether whether what what our plans are and whether you can activate it or not. Or if it's owned by another public body like the canal, for instance. If it's in private ownership, it becomes a little bit more complicated. Uh, we're in the process of revising our stored space advice, but we still have advice online that says, here's how you can do a model agreement with private owners that doesn't take away the development um, potential. So some private owners want to keep the development potential because they've got a value on their books and they're scared that if a community go in and improve a space to make them feel better as a community, that they're then going to start campaigning that it should be open space and then it should be rezoned. And that might ultimately be the end result for the ground, but it might not be. It might be about the end result being the community cohesion, the community having that resilience to move on and improve other sites. Uh, and some of the stuff we're trying to do just to run it off very quickly through the development plan and the open space, which most councils are trying to do, is to say, um, even if it does become development land, we are going to ask for open space. We are going to ask for community space within that development. So if a community are acting on the space and it does become development, they may still have access to it after that development has gone ahead. Great, that's, that's really interesting. Uh, I think Hilda is going to come in here now. I think that's really excellent advice. I think networking and building effective networks is crucial um, for anything going forward. And if people um, Google network weavers, there's a particularly good website that offers a variety of um, tools and ideas, um, as well as a newsletter, which offers tips on networking. Because what you can find is that different people have different visions of what they think should happen. And a lot of energy can be taken up trying to convince other people which vision is the vision that's going to work. Whereas weaving a network, you're finding people where there's an area of commonality. So energy goes into, okay, where are we going with this rather than what agenda? Because for all, everything, has to revolve around the people who live in that particular area, often to get things started um, or to support things to develop, does need a bit of input from agencies and sometimes agencies have got their agendas. So networking, clarity, coming without the label of your job, but coming as a human being with a common interest in creating something in your community, whether you live, work, play there, um, is a good way to start and a good way um, to preserve your energy as well. Uh, Bob, Julianne, would you like to come in at all to add to that? Any no, it, for starting out? Yes, well, exactly. It's uh, As you say, first of all, you got to get the community on side. And the other, the other part of that are the, the politicians. If you can, you got to get the politicians to somehow, you know, somehow help. Sometimes they don't. Uh, but, um, you know, that's that's what we found at the beginning. That was, you know, the hardest part was getting everybody, you know, facing the right way, so to speak, because other people, uh, they didn't think it was such a great idea, you know. Uh, but uh, eventually we talked them around. Yeah, I guess that's the, the big thing with Project List is getting lots of voices in one, one direction. Sean, I think you were going to... India. Just really quickly, um, Kat is linked to what um, what everyone's just said there, but I think when you're setting up an initiative as well, it's important to think about the whole variety of benefits that you might be expecting to achieve, because 
Um, sometimes you might be focused on one particular aspect, whether that's environmental protection, for example, mm -hmm. but actually, if you think about the social and the economic benefits too, yeah. at the beginning, it means that you might open up more avenues to funding, for example, mm -hmm. from different um, funding sources. So just a, a quick point on that. And and also because uh, Gillian and I are, have been saying this for quite a long time now about the, getting all the benefits out of nature-based solutions and not just focusing on one aspect of it. So um, that, that's what I would say. Uh Sean, I've got a, a particular question for yourself. Uh, just something you flashed up, um, the kind of matrix behind nature-based solutions. How how easy is it to access the, the, the research? Is it there or is it a challenge um, to kind of underpin these principles, particularly from a kind of local government perspective going forward? Yeah, well, I guess, I mean, the term nature-based solutions is, is really familiar to me and probably some of the rest of us on this call. But as I said in my presentation, it is actually quite a relatively new term, I suppose, um, and unfamiliar to most people. So there is a lot of information out there. And when I started in Connected Nature, it was a bit overwhelming, actually, trying to do the, the research to work out exactly what it is we mean by these terms. And the other thing I would say is as well is that because it is a new term, it's evolving as well. Um, I mean, only just last year, the IUCN and the EU updated their definition of what a nature-based solution was. Um, but Gillian posted uh, a link there to the Connect in Nature website, so um, connectinature.eu, I think it is. Um, and we've got a whole range of information on there, really simple, straightforward, easy to understand guidebooks and toolkits um, that anyone can access. So I'd recommend having a look at our website to begin with. Um, but um, beyond that, I would expect um, people to become much more familiar with, with these terms, the sort of nature-based terms, because um, particularly with, um, with national um, planning policy about to move in that direction with the new MPF4 coming out too. So I would um, yeah, keep an eye out for that. Thank you. Um, and, and Hilda, I had one for yourself, just uh, after watching your presentation. Um, one thing you kind of picked up on was that Drum Chapel a lot of the time does get a kind of a negative uh, image, both from, I guess, local press, but also maybe slightly wider kind of the Glasgow regional context. Um, how, how do you contract that as a, a local based, community based organisation? Um, and really kind of get that community buy-in. So I guess that would be kind of applicable to other areas in the city or groups as well. Yeah, I think the I think the challenge is that there are there is an unconscious bias which has been fed over the years through the media, humor, um, and, and so many different things around the particular communities and particular areas. And it takes time to transform that. So uh, a few years ago, there was there was a there was some press coverage about isolation, and the press coverage in the television was about people being isolated at Christmas, which is true that can happen. But when the cameras were out filming, there were also local people dressed as characters from Frozen, randomly giving out Christmas presents to people, just to make people smile. And the media were, oh, that was very curious about that. So they came over and had a chat. None of that was shown in the news that night. Instead, the coverage in the news was how lonely people are, which is true, many people are, but that it would have been nice to be balanced with. And this is what so this is some of the actions that the community are doing. So I think it's it's beholden to all of us to try and be ambassadors while they will work, let, rest, play. Um or live in a, in a particular community to try and promote the best of that community. And it's partly why we also put a bit Drum Chapel Cares about the natural world. Oh, Hilda, you're frozen. I've just put the, sorry, I've just put the link into the chat box about the Drum Chapel Cares about the natural world poster, because I think that demonstrates from Tidy Drum Chapel to Green Drum Chapel to Friends of Drum Chapel Park to a whole host of things um, that people are doing. And it's about how we find ways through Twitter, Facebook, local press, national press, um, the news on telly um, to try and also share the good news stories. Because unfortunately, sometimes there is a, a double-edged sword here. 
to secure funding, you have to pull out all the statistics that demonstrate why this area is worthy of that investment. However, by doing that, you're constantly, you're not taking an asset-based approach um, because you're focusing on what's wrong and what you want to fix. Whereas people aren't broken, communities aren't broken. It's mass unemployment and what's going to happen after people come off a furlough, who knows? So there's there's also within the nature-based solutions is how do we create new green economies? Um, and how do we take leads on that? So I don't know if that's a, it's, a, it's an awful big answer, but yeah, marketing um, is is how we, we help um, yeah. challenge the, the stigma or yeah. unconscious bias. No, I, I totally agree. I think it's it, it, it hopefully grows a little bit easier as we continue on, we're more, much more connected these days with Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and all sorts. Um, I know Julianne, you, you put your hand up and Julianne as well, just to come in. Um, just to say, anyone watching this, if they can't see the links in the chat box, uh, the RTPI West Scotland Twitter will uh, tweet out all the, the links that were being provided by the our speakers. Uh, Julianne, know if you want to come in. I was just going to say where our local nature reserve is, is in an area that's quite deprived and um, we basically, um, the, the volunteers we have in the management group are just so on it, it's unbelievable and I think that the community buy-in, so community volunteers are so worthy, so if there's going to be a, a space, the community volunteers are your main link because there's things like clean the scheme where maybe the council are maybe not going out to clean the area as much as they should. So they created community groups called Clean the Scheme, who they go out and litter pick. Um, when we had our open day, people said, I can't believe that this local nature reserve is like this in the middle of Postal. And it's all because people were of the whole negative attitude. And then when the, the, the green space opened, people wanted to, to, to muck in, they wanted to help, they wanted to do more, they wanted to make this space a good space, they wanted to make it a family space. Because when I first joined, people would say, oh, you wouldn't walk through there yourself. There was a total stigma. And now it's just an amazing space where families can enjoy it any time of the day. And the volunteers that we have on the management group, I mean, they go on there on a Friday night and if there's kids drinking, they'll say, listen, it's your green space, you use it, but just take your bottles away. And they now do that. I mean, years ago, you'd be like, yeah, right, whatever. But they do do it. They, they're so proud of this new space. So my advice would be, in areas where they have got a negative kind of attitude, oh, this, this is going to be, this is going to get wrecked, this is going to get this, this is going to get that, get everyone in the community involved, get them to buy in, and your community volunteers are your worthiest people in there, and that will make it successful, because we're finding that's our, that's our hidden gem right now, is our volunteers and who are in the community. Great, thank you. And uh, Gillian, did you want to come in as well? Yeah, I'm going to make two very, very quick points. I'm going to uh, follow on Julianne because the community involvement in Postle that you've got was one of the reasons why when we were looking at the World Heritage Site that runs along the back and we were looking for where do we put the distant stone, where do we put the huge um, Roman head that's going into Glasgow, Postle was one of the places we thought that's a good place to be because it connects in with Lamb Hill, it gives it something else. And just to give you an antidote, when it was going in and we were just checking it about a week before, one of your locals turned up with his can and made a comment to say, oh, that'll never last. And then the next thing he had his phone out was taking photos saying, this is beautiful. I'm going to come and see him every day. And you thought, he's told me the obvious. And then he's completely flipped to what he's actually going to do. Um, and while there have been some hiccups, I think it's been appreciated that there's this big thing there that kind of gives it another reason why people should come. The other very quick thing I was going to say in response to Hilda and the asset management is we have tried from a city council point of view to try and capture a whole load of that data so that social cohesion, health and well-being, economic environment, biodiversity on a visualised map-based dashboard but we're now trying to add that lived experience in. So you should with modern technology be able to capture Bob talking about why he likes Postle or Hilda talking about the situatory and actually if Kat is looking at a planning application and she's looking at something from Chapel hopefully in the future she'll be able to click on that map and not only will she get her baseline planning data she'll have Bob or Hilda telling her what a wonderful place it is that can give that rich experience added into the the information that's going to councils but also added into the rich experience that you can then feed straight into applications so if we can streamline your application process it will make it easy that you don't have to go and look for that data um what i will do is put that link in it's a horrible long link but i'll put it in the chat and somebody can attempt to tweet it out at some point <laughs> yeah I, I think really touching on kind of what bob 
said earlier, you've got to give people to have pride in their local area. And that really is at the heart. If you're going to have a sustainable community, you need a community in the first first place. Um, and so given that that pride in that area um, and through all these kind of wonderful projects, really good. I'm just conscious of time at the moment. So I think I'll stop it there and say thank you very much to, to all our speakers today. Um, it's been a real pleasure to hear such a kind of breadth of initiatives in Glasgow. And this is really just a, a taster of some local initiatives. There's hundreds, if not thousands, across the city, um, and they're really making some great strides to to really change areas of the city for the better. I would like to thank you all for joining us this afternoon to explore some sustainable community initiatives in Glasgow. Special thanks to our speakers, Gillian, Sean, Hilda, Julianne and Bob, whose details I'm now sharing on screen if anyone would like to follow up with them directly. I've been Catherine Alito for the RTPI West Scotland Committee. Thank you.